Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, How to Troubleshoot Routing and Connectivity in Your AWS Environment. Uh, before we dive into today's presentation, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. If you have a question at any point during the uh, presentation, please submit via the chat window or the Q&A window. We will address your questions throughout the conversation and at the end of the presentation. Also, the recorded version of today's presentation will be available following the event. Please look for an email from the Kentic team to rewatch and share. Okay, Dan, I think we're ready to turn it over to you. Thanks, Angela. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, as Angela said, my name is Dan Rohan. I'm the product manager for the data center and cloud solutions here at Kentic. Uh, today, I'm excited to talk with you about how you can use Kentic to solve routing and connectivity issues in your AWS cloud environment. I thought we'd just go over the agenda real quick to give you a sense of, of what we'll cover. Um, I'll begin by just doing a quick overview of Kentec, you know, who we are, what problems we solve, what our platform looks like, and that kind of thing. Then I'll just do a few minutes uh, talking about, you know, really what makes networking in the cloud sort of uniquely challenging. Um, then we'll transition to a quick discussion of uh, use cases that, that we intend to solve with Kentec Cloud. Um, hopefully these will sound, you know, familiar to you because you've actually struggled with them. Uh, I won't spend too much time teeing all that up because I do want to have, uh, you know, some significant chunk for us to, you know, uh, take a look at the product showing you what, you know, uh, we can actually do. I'm solving a few real use cases. Um, hopefully giving you the sense that, you know, you can use Kentic Cloud to move faster, um, you know, and allow your network teams or yourself to continue to add, you know, your expertise in networking uh, uh, you know, uh, just applied to the cloud. So let's jump into it. We're going to do a poll to start. Um, and I just wanted to get a sense from everyone what tools they use to monitor their cloud networks today. So if, take a minute and just pop in your answers here. Yeah, so we're seeing some responses come in. We'll give it a few more seconds. OK. And thanks to the, appreciate that. Th thanks to those of you that uh, uh, supplied some answers here. This is really interesting for me uh, as a product manager because, um, you know, I have perspectives on all these different tools, which I'm going to share with you, of course. And, you know, um, it, it's really interesting for me because it, it tells me how you've started to approach the problems that you're finding in, in the cloud network. So thanks again. All right. So I like to start by talking about how Kentic is first and foremost really a network observability uh, company. Um, and of course, that means since it's a new term, we have to kind of define what we mean by that. Um, so despite this being a marketing slide that you see in front of you, um, anyone that's a network practitioner, I think will recognize the truth that that's contained here in which is, you know, um, networks are more complex, right? They're talking about managing hybrid networks, um, containerized networks, you know, uh, we've got automated, uh, software defined networks that, that are chock full of, of overlays and, and changing dynamically. And this is the truth, whether you're in the cloud or you're talking on prem. But at the same time, you know, these networks are becoming ever more critical, right? The, the, the world has changed. We live in a decentralized post COVID world. Um, the network not only keeps our businesses running, but we know in this world, it keeps us talking to our families. Um, it keeps us entertained. Uh, it keeps us healthy. And, and it even, you know, runs our homes and our cars these days. And so what that has led to is the shift in expectations from our customers and our end users. Um, you know, these folks expect that network to be up and running and performing great all the time. You know, it's not dissimilar to how you expect the power grid to perform. Um, so as an industry, we've been addressing this problem in other parts of the tech stack by introducing tools that can work with this dynamism. So you think about modern full stack tools that allow SREs and DevOps teams um, really to set up their environment and, and harness, you know, machine data that they can get their hands on, any machine data. Um, but the network world has kind of been stuck using yesterday's tools, you know, on-prem boxes, virtual appliances, clunky UIs, um, bad or sometimes non-existent APIs, and so on and so forth. You know, we've left this problem pretty much untouched, at least for now. So we've got those issues of network complexity, you know, criticality, high customer expectations. And our perspective in Kentic is that in order to even the playing field um, and give network teams the leg up they need to thrive and really add value for their organizations in the cloud, engineers need to be able to ask questions about their network. You know, they, it needs to be any kind of question about any kind of network, corporate WAN, data center, cloud, you know, questions like who's hogging the direct connect? Um, 
where did the transit gateway forward my traffic? Why can't these two instances talk? You know, what should I be performance testing in the cloud? Can I control data transfer costs? Are my workloads near my customers? Hopefully some of these questions are questions you've asked yourself and we're on the right track here. So let's take a look at what a network observability strategy looks like in real life. Um, so I'll, I won't spend too much time here, but there's just six attributes that I like to share about that we do at Kentech and we think are attributes of any good network observability strategy. You can build this on your own, you can buy Kentech, and obviously I hope you do, but this is fundamental stuff. So the first thing here <clears throat> that we do at Kentech, um, and you can do as well, is to take data from all networks. So we need to be able to see all the networks, the data centers, the clouds, the SaaS services, um, the physical network edge, the internet paths, the container networks, any place that your traffic goes all the way through to its destination. Um, you also need to be able to ingest and process all of that telemetry, right? The flows and the VPCs, the streaming telemetry, uh, host data, SNMP, synthetic tests, all these things are important because uh, and we don't want to leave any on the table, right? Because this is where our industry has a bit of a disadvantage. Um, most of us mere mortals need to rely on whatever telemetry our vendors supply us. We can't just write a program to go and pull data out of like slash proc in Linux, you know? We need to be able to take what we have and get it into the observability platform. It's huge. It's hugely important to our success. Um, third thing here is that you want to be able to enrich that telemetry with context, so you can put the issues that you're dealing with into perspective and then prioritize them. Right? Um, you know, for example, a flow record is valuable. It has the port, the protocol, the IP address. Um, you know, but when all of those things are dynamic, uh, you need a system that can say, yes, port A on IPB yesterday at 3 p.m. That was our backend caching service. And by the way, it was communicating with an IP address in the Isle of Man. And that IP address happens to be a known malware command and control host at that same time. Um, so once we have all that data, we, we need to have a place to put it that we can ingest it in real time. It can scale out. It can grow with our needs. It has APIs to kind of help us uh, fit like a glove in, part, in, in, in the total environment. Um, it should work with our existing tooling. Um, it should play nice with our automation and CI CD frameworks, you know. Um, and ideally, it should work without diverting a lot of attention from your team. And then what should you be able to do when you have that system there? Well, first thing is it would be great if the system could help you make sense of the data by providing you with real-time insights that are generated using AI and ML algorithms. Um, insights that are actually useful, insights that can help you see trends in your data uh, before they become problems. Um, and then of course, you want the signals that you're aware of, the dashboards and the alerts that you manually configure and you always wanna keep an eye on, your KPIs, your bandwidth limits, you know, your errors. Um, all of those things, you know, you need to be able to get. And then you need to be able to take that, that pre-built content and that automatically discovered content and apply your human brain to it, which is what we're saying here, which is let's, let's take that as a starting place and really dig deep and find out, you know, let's take this data point, let's put it up on a map, let's zoom into it, let's zoom out and look at this data point over two weeks or a month. Um, and then last, you need to be able to take all of that data and all of the things that you've learned about it and put it into the pipeline that you're using to solve problems for your big picture here, right? So this is your analytics. This is your messaging workflows. Let's get this data into Slack. Let's get it into emails. Let's get it into reports in front of the right people. Um, and so, you know, once you have that, you've got one of the biggest strengths of a network observability strategy, considering itself is part of a whole ecosystem of tooling that's really necessary to run modern infrastructure. We can't consider ourselves um, is a siloed network anymore. The network is not the end all be all. All right. So like I said, you can build it, you can buy it. And if you choose to buy Kentic, you know, just rest assured you're getting network observability because Kentic sort of coined the term. You know, we've got 300 companies using our product today, you know, from huge service providers, some of the largest in the world, um, some of the most amazing SaaS and household names in the enterprise space. We operate globally. Uh, we ingest trillions of records every single day. Um, and, you know, customer success is a huge part of what we do. I used to run uh, the customer success engineering team. And so I can tell you personally, this is a metric that we look at all the time. We've got 95% uh, customer satisfaction scores. These are the kinds of scores that you only see in companies like Southwest and Nordstrom, um, pretty much unheard of in, in our space. 
Um, upon metrics that you guys probably care about, you all care about, would be uptime, right? And our average customers uh, see an increase of 25% uptime. So that really matters. And what this means is that companies that are really trying to get to the top of their game or are at the top of the game, um, you know, they, they choose Kentic. And uh, we're very proud of that. So now you know the basics of Kentic. Let's talk about why we built Kentic Cloud. So the story really begins with some discovery work we've been doing. You know, we'd released cloud flow logs um, in a very, very basic way uh, with very, very basic support for maps. And we were starting to talk with customers to try to figure out, you know, why they had purchased this logging capability. Um, and we had some assumptions that we, you know, made that, you know, customers were interested in seeing uh, region to region traffic and zone to zone traffic. I um, mean, we weren't wrong, but we were missing a ton. So here are some actual quotes that we have, snippets of quotes that when we, when we started talking to people. So the cloud is a black box for me. What does this mean? It really means that, hey, um, for years I've been operating services on infrastructure that I can manage and control. And now I'm shifting them over to someone else's infrastructure. And I feel like I can't manage and control that quite as much. And therefore I can't guarantee this service. Um, I need a tool that helps me identify connectivity problems. This is a huge issue. Um, Often network teams are some of the last teams to be brought in when organizations migrate to the cloud. And they have this Gordian knot, I call it, of, of problems that have been uh, kind of created organically, um, which leads to the next quote here. Cloud prov uh, the cloud provider tools were, were built for developers, not for the network. It's a theme that's emerging here. There's something about the developers and the network that is causing a problem, and we're gonna drill into that. Traffic costs are killing me, um, a very common, uh, thing that I'm sure some of you are nodding along uh, with is, you know, um, a CTO, CIO, some cloud management office opens up their AWS bill and sees, you know, unexpected high traffic egress costs. And they pick up the phone or drop an email towards their, uh, their teams that are, uh, um, you know, responsible for the networks. And they say, hey, what's up with the, the egress costs out of our Singapore region? And it's up to the en engineer to try to figure out what those traffic costs are. Um, and if they don't have VPC flow logs and they don't know how to use them, um, that can be a huge problem. Um, no one thinks about networks when building apps, but they blame it later on. Once again, back to that same problem where the networks and clouds often develop organically. All right, so I'm not gonna read every single quote here, but you know what we really understood is that, hey, there's something very different about cloud networking. And as we continued to talk with folks, we started to understand this kind of, um, this underpinning of truth. And, and we built Kentic from this perspective, or we built Kentic Cloud from this perspective. So starting with kind of a duh thing, cloud networks changed everything. And yesterday's tools kind of pretend otherwise. That The deal is that, you know, um, a lot of monitoring companies have taken sort of an outdated approach to monitoring the cloud. Um, you know, they just keep what they've been doing. They keep doing what they've been doing with SNMP, but then maybe they'll add on a smattering of CloudWatch metrics or ingest VPC flow logs in the same way that they might ingest NetFlow or SFlow. And honestly, the approach just doesn't work today. You know, SNMP is outdated, obviously. It's, you know, still quite useful, but it's not useful in the cloud. Um, flow is absolutely a good start, but what good is it when we have containers that spin up and then spin down in minutes or workloads that are transportable um, and everything sort of runs on an overlay network, you know. Um, the other aspect of this is that uh, this approach just doesn't handle cloud scale. You know, we're talking with customers that generate greater than 90 terabytes of flow logs a month. So try throwing that, or try, I <laughs> can't speak. Try throwing that at like a, a virtual appliance, right? Try throwing that into a massive cluster um, and, and keeping your queries running fast. Sure, anything's possible, right? Um, but as a whole, I think our thinking as an industry has shifted. Network engineers want to be able to add value by exercising their core competencies. You know, they're good at networking. Um, and they don't care to do the feeding of, of massive storage and compute clusters. We just don't think like that anymore. So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is that the network management plane has been democratized. And what that means uh, is, is that Cloud providers have done a super awesome job of virtualizing and abstracting the network in a way that physical network problems like erroring ports or high CPUs or failed line cards don't become the problem of network engineers. 
And what they've done is they've democratized control of the network. And this is obviously a good thing from you know, many respects in terms of the speed and the scale. It's precisely why companies go to the cloud. But it has an overlooked and, and seriously bad downside. And that's that the network perimeter is dissolving. So companies that have matured in the cloud are you know, uh, just beginning to understand that there, there's an evolution in their architectures. So taking a step back, you know, historically, the network has served as kind of a boundary where organizations can apply policies to control the costs, the security, and the performance of their services, right? Um, they can make sure that their applications are performing well, that their infrastructure is healthy. If you think about the edge and the core components of a network, you know, these are places where our industry has for years installed really expensive routers to control network paths, firewalls, intrusion prevention systems to maintain a security perimeter. And these devices are, are configured and managed and monitored by, you know, super highly trained professionals. We don't just give the passwords out for these devices to anyone. Um, likewise, if you're a customer in a data center, you can't just set up a new internet connection because uh, you don't like your firewall that your organization has set up. But when cloud providers give just anyone the tools they need to, to build and run infrastructure, they've done exactly that. Um, you know, most organizations don't have policies in place that prevent accounts from setting up new internet gateways or configuring new security groups or routing policies. And in fact, many organizations kind of encourage this because, you know, it allows their teams to move fast, right? But that's when the problems start to creep in. You know, you see internal communications that get leaked over the internet. Uh, network costs increase as inefficient architectures start getting put into place. Um, routes are black holed and security groups are misconfigured and apps can't talk to each other. Um, and then the burden of correcting these problems falls back on the network team. And despite this becoming the network team's problem, you know, this, this, there's a fallacy that sort of matters uh, and it's impacting, um, you know, the way that we, we, we do work. It's, it's that, the fallacy that the network matters less. It's been around for decades, but it just feels a little more real today. Um, you know, so I want to address this straight up and say, yeah, things have changed in the network world. 15 years ago, you couldn't launch a business or run a school without having a, a server in a rack somewhere with a Cisco switch and a router sitting on top. But that's just not the case. Today, you know, you can completely get up and going, uh, you know, without that kind of knowledge. Um, and so we have to admit, and a modern ecosystem has to admit that things have changed and we need to adapt. But instead of seeing this adaptation, we've kind of seen the market try to throw the baby out with the bathwater because as we mentioned earlier, <laughs> if anything, the network matters more now. Um, it's kept our world afloat for the last 13, 14 months. Um, but instead of you know doing the caring and feeding of that switch at the top of the rack, network engineers are thinking about more how they can engineer their networks to help their businesses move faster, remain more secure, be more highly available, be more responsive for the customer. But honestly, this subtlety seems to have been lost in the clamor to kind of keep everything cloudy. So once network engineers are fully engaged, they can't go back to their, their old tools. They look at the tools that do exist for them today in, in, in the modern stack, and those aren't really cut out for them either. Um, naturally, they're gonna start by looking at the tools that come bundled with their cloud providers. And, and quickly, they're gonna realize that these aren't the tools that had them in mind as their target audience. Yeah, they can get a list of top talkers on an interface, but first they have to learn how to write SQL queries, right? Um, they might be able to set uh, or retrieve metrics from their, their cloud watch, for example, about their, their gateways and load balancers, but then setting up the thresholds and baselines is just a huge amount of toil. Um, the bottom line is that these tools were written by developers for monitoring applications, not cloud networks. Um, and of course, the tools don't pay any attention to the fact that, let's say, 72%, I think there's the number of networks, use some kind of hybrid or multi-cloud architectures, which introduces serious visibility gaps. All right, so I've given you all a bit of a spiel <laughs> on, on why we felt it was important to build Kenta Cloud. So I want to actually spend some time now talking with you about you know, how you can use it to solve real problems that crop up on a cloud network. Um, so. I'll start today by showing you how you can visualize cloud routing and, um, and troubleshoot some routing problems. And then we're going to do uh, some of that same work with direct connects and site-to-site -site VPN interconnects. And then we'll wrap up by showing you a few other things you can do to resolve cloud connectivity problems. So let's start by talking cloud routing. Um, all right. So 
let's talk about how you do routing in AWS today. Um, if you haven't spent much time doing uh, AWS cloud routing, then you might be under the impression that like compared to say doing routing on a Cisco or a Juniper device, it's a walk in the park. Um, so, well, there's like definitely some underpinning truths that, that cloud routing is simpler to grasp than say like BGP traffic engineering. The reality is that network engineers can log into a physical device, run one or two commands, get the info they need to make a decision on, on how to reroute traffic or modify a routing policy. But in the cloud, because network engineers are being called in to kind of fix bad problems at scale, they're asked to figure out cloud routing on you know, a much more consistent basis. It's happening all the time. Um, and you know, it's in AWS, doing this is nowhere near as simple as running one or two commands. So say you need to figure out how your traffic is flowing between VPCs over a transit gateway in your cloud network. If you're not already familiar with the transit gateway, we'll just talk about that real quick here. You know, um, transit gateways, you, you can think of them as, as very simple but super powerful cloud routers. You know, you can attach them to your VPCs um, and to your interconnect infrastructure. Um, you can even attach SD-WAN devices to them uh, or anything that can tunnel GRE and then use that to control all of your, your routing and forwarding in your virtual environment. It's awesome. Um, but the main problem with them is that they're kind of a black box. You know, you can configure subnet or VPC level route tables to forward traffic into the transit gateway. But then what happens is that when that traffic is shunted over to the router, you lose visibility. And transit gateways support both static and dynamic routes. So if you're having connectivity issues, you sort of need to know where a packet was forwarded at any given point in time. Um, so you need to know how that traffic's flowing. Um, and maybe you need to answer this question because you're working with a company, I mean, working with a team that's making a change to their network. They, maybe, they're, uh, maybe you're working a ticket that's trying to figure out why a container and a subnet's not able to communicate with another subnet. You know, in AWS, the process to find this, this traffic flow looks like this. Um, it's almost funny. So you log into the console, you go to the EC2 UI, you find the VPC ID that's associated with a particular instance. Then you change to the VPC UI. You find the route table UI. You find the transit gateway associated with the VPC ID. Then you change to the transit gateway UI and you find the transit gateway associated with the VPC. And then you, transit, you change to the transit gateway attachment UI and find the attachment ID associated with that VPC. Then you, <laughs> you change to the transit gateway route table UI and you find the route table associated with the attachment ID. Hopefully you have not forgotten to copy as you're going along because you're doing a lot in copy and paste. I assume that if folks are, are paying attention right now, they're nodding their heads because this is what life is like when you're doing this stuff in AWS. So it can get a little ugly and then it can get really, really ugly if you're starting to train or chain along um, one transit gateway to another, which we'll see here in a minute. Um, so how does this look better when we do things, oh, getting ahead of myself, when we do things in Kentic? Let's take a look. It's pretty easy. So remember our use case here is that we want to show traffic through a transit gateway um, and, and be able to trace the path that it's going to take. Uh, I'll do, so, do a little bit of orientation of the product as we go along. So I'm going to click into the Kentic map. And then I'm going to drill into the Amazon map here. All right. So what do we see? A um, bit of orientation. We've got the on-prem block. This is where if you've got the uh, customer gateways or routers that terminate your VPN or your uh, transit, I'm sorry, your direct connect um, devices registered in Kentic, um, they'll show up here. We don't have that in our demo environment today. But what we do have is a site-to-site -site VPN that's connecting us to our data center. Um, and we've got a number of regions with VPCs in there. And we can see here that each region is represented by a gray box. And then each VPC inside that gray box is a purple card. Outside of these gray boxes, we've got lines showing traffic to and from these regions. And then over on the right, we've got our transit gateway architecture. So we can see here that in US East 1, we've got a transit gateway. It's peered up to a transit gateway in California, which is also peered up to a transit gateway in Singapore. And then we've got an orphaned transit gateway sitting over here in US East 2. Nothing's, you know, it's not connected to anything. And we can see here that the tra transit gateway is actually connecting out to these different VPNs, which then brings us back to our on-prem network. Okay, so we can click on any of these VPC cards to drill in and get a sense of, of the VPC architecture. 
So in this case, we've got prod app here. There's a VPC ID and the CIDR block associated with it. And we've got the different availability zones that prod app is deployed into and the subnets in each zone. And so down here, we can see the other VPCs in an expanded form. We can also see that this traffic from US East one to US West one is going over an internet gateway. Not great. Um, and <clears throat> we, we can see the, the gateways below it. And we can also see how transit gateway attachments are, are uh, routed back up to the transit gateway themselves. So below that, we've got these different VPC cards and we can see that based on the numbers in each card, how much traffic is going to and from the selected uh, VPC. So I'm gonna choose this VPC here. Uh, and let's say we're interested in this subnet here, stage AZB. And you know we want to be able to understand where traffic is flowing out of this thing through the transit gateway and so on and so forth. So first thing I can do is I can say, show my connections. And right there, we can see this is a very busy UI. Uh, I'm sorry, very busy, uh, very busy subnet. Um, over here, we've got mesh. So you can see that in, in, in uh, by design, this thing's talking to every single thing. Um, and we can hover over any of these lines to get an at a glance uh, viewing of how much traffic is being sent from subnet to subnet or down to the different gateways. All right, so um, let's also show you what we can do when I click on hide connections and then, actually I'll keep that up and then we'll do show details. So now on the sidebar, we have the traffic that's originating in this subnet. And then below that, critically, we've got the route table that's associated with the subnet. And we're showing that we've got a black hole route uh, set up in the subnet. Um, don't know why that is yet. Maybe we'll find out later. Um, and then we can also take a look and say, okay, this traffic um, you know, is coming out of this subnet. What are the IPs that are communicating here? So I can just do an IP query, for example. All right, now we can see the IP pairs and you know, because we keep context in there, what if we wanted to do instances? All right, so now we know the instances that are associated. So if those IPs are ephemeral, we'll keep track using the instance metadata instead of the IP. All right, but we're interested in, in traffic out. So we know that the on-prem network is 192.168.0.0. So let's come down here to the route table and just see what it says. So we see that 192.168.0016 is going to the transit gateway. That's good. So I'm going to go ahead and copy the transit or the, the route table. Or I'm sorry, the, the route that we're interested in. And let's just take a look at follow the line from the transit gateway up to, I'm sorry, from the attachments to the gateway. And then we're going to do the show details. And now we're going to pull the transit gateway route table. And if you're not familiar, transit gateway route tables are kind of like VERF route tables where you can have a different route table for each attachment. So let's see which VERF has that. And so we see here that we've got this attachment and we're gonna forward all traffic destined for 192.168.0.0 to this VA to CA peering attachment. So that tells us not surprisingly that this is gonna follow this peering attachment down to this other tra transit gateway. This is where it would be an incredible nightmare to do this in, in AWS. So now we can do the same thing down here. Let's say show details open the route table for this aggregator. And we can see now that we've actually got two different verbs with this route in it. And both of them, luckily for us, are going to send that traffic straight up to the VPN hub. So we follow those lines and we're over here in the VPN. So just to recap what we've seen here, we've followed traffic from a subnet um, down through a gateway uh, attachment up to the transit gateway down to another transit gateway that's aggregating a number of transit gateways and out to the site-to-site -site VPN. So we now know the full path and we now know how to begin digging in a little bit further. All right, I'm gonna take a minute for a bit of water. Okay, now let's talk about how we troubleshoot the performance on direct connection site-to-site -site VPNs because this kind of infrastructure is very special. Why is that? Let me get over here. So. When we were designing this cloud product, you know, we talked with tons of, of network folks to kind of understand some of the biggest pain points. And nearly every last person literally mentioned that a large majority of their time is spent troubleshooting traffic flows to and from direct connects and site-to-site -site VPNs, which 
makes a ton of sense when you think about it, right? Direct connects and site-to-site -site VPNs are the places where we have the most opportunity to make configuration mistakes, right? You need to get your routing configured just so on both the cloud and the on-prem networks. Otherwise, you'll run the risk of black holing traffic or misrouting traffic over the internet. And you know, with people moving fast in the cloud and the, the network management plane being democratized, you know, it's really easy for users to bypass this infrastructure, which can of course cause problems with your security, your poor performance and your cost. Um, also, these are the components which are the very few parts of cloud networking with real bandwidth and real capacity constraints. You know, in uh, a cloud between two VPCs, you could, you totally can blast two gigs of traffic across the AWS network fabric. But if you try to do that on a one gig network, uh, I'm sorry, direct connection um, or a site to site VPN, you're going to start seeing bad performance problems, you know, dropped packets, retransmits and so on and so forth. So being able to look at your network performance problems and find all of these root causes is super critical. Last, um, if you've done any Google searches like site to, AWS site-to-site -site VPN troubleshooting, they've got guides that are great. They tell you to check 100,000 things to see if you're having problems. Not really, like, you know, 10. But if you don't have the tools to, to, to do what they ask you to do, like, for instance, one of the things for uh, um, a NAT gateway is to check for the, the TCP flags um, that are coming back from your instances to uh, their traffic gateways. Um, you know, how are you going to do that if you don't have VPC flow logs? And if you don't know how to query for the gateway traffic, and if you don't know how to interpret the TCP flags, um, it's, it's not pretty. So uh, that being said, you can get a great sense of how to troubleshoot this using Kentic without going to the length um, that I just described. So just to remind ourselves, the, the scenario is that we've got, we've traced this traffic back through to the direct connects. And so we want to come here to click on the cloud performance monitor. And this, by the way, this is a, a workflow that's dedicated specifically to the interconnection infrastructure that glues your cloud to your on-prem network. It's really another map that, hey there, buddy. Um, it's, it's, it's another map that, that shows the, the, uh, how, how we connect the regions and the VPCs they connect through straight through to the customer gateways and all of the infrastructure in between. Um, by the way, if we had direct connects in this lab, we would see them right below here. We don't have any in our, in our lab today. Um, so this is really useful for seeing network performance in these environments too, because what we do is we invite people to actually install a lightweight performance agent in these VPCs. So you can see here, we've got two paths that are actually monitored with performance. So I can say, you know, show me the details. Um, and this mouse over, we give the, you know, kind of at a glance, we can see that this is red, that there's some high latency and some high packet loss. And we can come over here and we can see the traffic. We can come down here to the performance. And there we go. Now we see the uh, performance in terms of latency and packet loss and jitter across this. And we can see that this is actually quite stable. It's been like this for some time. It's a demo environment. Um, and if we're interested in understanding, you know, what's causing some of these issues, we can dive deep because what comes with Kenta Cloud is a certain amount of um, credit synthetics, or I'm sorry, synthetic credits, um, which allows you to do certain things like, take a look at the path that this is taking over the entire, uh, over the internet. Remember, this is a site to site VPN. And so we're using the public internet to talk to the public address here. Um, we can analyze specific cops. We can see uh, the, the, uh, uh, the path that it's taking and using a time series data, you know, we can actually go back in time and see, you know, did this path change, you know, over the last three hours, six hours, one day, and so on and so forth and see how that's impacted our ability to communicate over that. And then the last thing here is we can also just take a look at the traffic um, here. So let's come and click on that. And we can say, yeah, um, here, let's see if I can find something with a bit more spikes. There we go. So we can say, yeah, user, we, we actually do see a spike that happened at the exact same time that you're reporting an error. Let's dig into that, you know, and we can say, let's take a look at the, uh, let's see a VPC. Let's do source VPC. Do we have a count in here? Let's see the source account. Was, who do we need to call and complain to, right? Um, so lots of different options for you to start to explore some of these important parts of your environment. Um, and I know we're running short on time here, so I will breeze along and just say that there's a few other things I wanted to show. Um, you can open up our cloud observation deck here, and we make it really easy to find 
areas where your network is um, dropping flows because of misconfigured or maybe properly functioning security groups. So I can come in here and say, view this in the Data Explorer. And if you're not familiar with the Data Explorer, it's sort of our ad hoc query tool that takes that um, the pre-built things that Kentic is uh, finding for you on your network and allows you to apply that human thinking and saying, like, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna dig into this myself. So what I've done here is I'm I've got that query that we're just looking at firewall action equals re reject. We're looking just at things that are staying internal. Um, and we can now see that, okay, these are two VPCs that are internal and we're, we're, we're dropping you know, a significant amount of traffic um, in terms of packets per second. There's another query that I wanna run that shows some value here as well. And then we'll move on to Q&A. And the query would be that we wanna identify black hole traffic. So we've got this new uh, forwarding state dimension, which shows you some of the thinking that Kentic is doing here. Um, so in AWS metadata, we have the status of every route. So whenever there's a black hole route introduced, we can find that in the routing table. What we've done is we marry that route table um, uh, data with the flows that are coming in. So if traffic is destined to a black hole route, we can mark that in the flow. And so we can see here that there's a certain amount of black hole traffic on our AWS network today. So I'm just gonna do a show by and say, show me the source IP and maybe the, uh, let's say, dest IP. Yeah, let's do that. And this might give us a clue. All right, it does. Now I can see that this is traffic bound for the internet. Um, let's actually throw a, another dest, I mean, sorry, another dimension in here. Let's throw the gateways IDs and types in. And that sort of tells a story too, right? Using our human brains to say, let's say, what's going on here? Aha, so now we see that this is actually going towards a peering connection, not the internet. And if you're not already getting where I'm going with this, peering connections need to be accepted by, there, there's a requester and an acceptor. And if they're not accepted, then any traffic that's forwarded to them is going to be black holed immediately. And that's what we've set up in our lab here to illustrate that. Okay, um, I think, I will move back to the slides here. And we got another poll before we move into Q&A time. Um, this one, we're just gonna ask, you know, what are the common cloud network problems that you and your team are getting involved in? What I'm looking for here as a product manager, I wanna know what you folks are, are, are struggling with. Um, I'm gonna take this data and use it as input for our own discovery processes to make sure that we can continue to um, you know, uh, revise the product, improve the product to meet your needs. And we can share the results now. All right, thanks for that, Angela. So this is really great for me to see. Um, it tells me that we're on the right track here um, by focusing on routing configuration and troubleshooting, um, sticking with, you know, the uh, security groups um, and NACL configuration troubleshooting. Network optimization, this is, this is great to see. Um, we know that organizations are asking their network engineers to figure out where to place their workloads and, and it's part of the migration process. So I'm really, really happy to see that. Thanks so much for sharing, I appreciate that. All right, so now we have some time for Q&A. Um, if, if folks wanna uh, ask their questions, Angela, you've got a protocol to follow? Yes, so thank you, Dan. Um, if you have any questions, please submit them during the uh, via the chat window, or you can uh, submit them during the uh, in the Q and A window as well. We did have a few questions come in during the presentation, Dan. So earlier on, we had a question come in from Jefferson. Thanks, Jefferson. Um, it's so to be clear, when you say network observability, um, is that to say network monitoring? You know, I think that the observability um, term is one that that's still being defined by different. Uh, companies, but for us, it really means, you know, yes, monitoring is a part of it, but it's really about um, being more flexible with how you present your data, um, allowing people to ask any question about that data, um, and then playing nicely in, in the world of other monitoring tools um, and realizing that, you know, you, you have, you're, you're part of a bigger whole. Great, great. Um, and then we had another question come in. It is, um, can you tell if a security group is blocking traffic in this tool? 
Oh, absolutely. That was the last use case I showed, but I'll bring it back up real quick under the cloud performance monitor. Let me get this pull out of the way. I'm sorry, out of the cloud landing page. We've got this. And so what this is actually showing us is, is where security groups are, are, are dropping traffic. And so I'm just opening this up in the data explorer. And all you really have to do is, is say, show, show me my instance to instance or my you know, uh, account to account. Um, you know, or even what is the exact security group that is, is dropping this traffic? So great question. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and then we did have another question here is, can you help find overlapping IPs slash CIDRs? Yeah. Great question. Right. It's a huge problem in, in the cloud. Um, yes, it's, it's super simple. You would just run a data explorer query, uh, where you said, show me all of my accounts or show me all of my VPCs and show me the, uh, the source IPs that are associated with those accounts. Um, and, and instantly, you know, it's going to pop out, uh, at you, which, which VPCs are, are, uh, configured with overlapping IP addresses. Perfect. Um, we do have time for a couple more questions. So if you haven't yet, you can still submit them. Um, and we do have a few more questions come in. Is uh, the documentation available? Is there a tutorial available so we can easily create a lab to confirm how it works? And then additionally, is Azure supported? All good questions. Okay. So documentation is out there. You can get started today. Um, definitely very, very easy. We have some automated solutions too. If you use Terraform, um, you can you can uh, take a look at some sample Terraform that we have that will help you get started, you know, almost instantly. Um, yeah, documentation's out there. And also, um, uh, we've got a number of, of tutorials on YouTube that you can reference. But what I'd recommend is once you get started, um, reach out to you know your your sales team because we've got some amazing CS and uh, SEs that are uh, totally happy to to jump on the phone and walk you through every single use case you can think of. Um, pretty low pressure sales cycle too, if I can say so. We also have um, every two weeks we have ritual design clinics, and um, every third of those we actually rotate in a specific cloud edition one. So the next one, I believe, is on June 23rd, which is a, a cloud edition one. And I will link that in the, uh, the chat shortly here. And to answer your question, Shizu, the recording will be available. And we will be sending that out um, in the next day or so to all of the registrations. So um, we did have one more question come in. And um, it is, again, about AWS so uh, and Azure. So, most of the examples are in, in AWS. Is the methodology the same with Azure? Yeah. So, so uh, yeah, I was hoping we get back to Azure because I forgot to answer that earlier. Um, so we do have support for AWS, Azure, GCP, and IBM Cloud. However, what you saw today with the maps and the performance monitor, those are all AWS specifics. Um, we have uh, great support for Azure, tons of dimensions. I'll even show you what we support, but it's more of a data explorer experience. Um, and so what I recommend for Azure, IBM, and GCP folks is that you know you, you can send me an email. Um, you know, I'll show you my contact details later, or you can, you can uh, look at our kb.kentech.com. Um, and see what the level of support is. But generally speaking here, I'll, I'll give you a, a quick sense by looking at it. So I'll just show the dimensions that we parse out of flow logs and metadata for Microsoft Azure. And so while it's a, a more limited set, know that we started with AWS and we're setting the standard there, and then we're gonna bring up each cloud into parity with it. Any other questions, Angela? Um, no, I think that's all we have for today. Thanks, Dan. And thank you to everybody for joining us today. If you have any additional questions, you can always email us at webinars at kentic.com and we'll be sure to connect you with Dan or whoever's the right person. And um, yeah, I think we're ready to wrap up here, Dan. 
Okay, sorry, I forgot about these slides, right? So yeah, I just I just wanted to mention, yeah, we can you can get started today at Kentic.com. You get a 30-day free trial. We support all the clouds, um, get you that visibility into your your uh, your interconnects and your transit gateways. Um, we offer some free synthetic credits that you know are for the lifetime of the, the product um, and uh, automation guidance. So um, definitely check that out. And here is my contact details for those of you that have additional questions. Um, definitely feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn, Twitter, or shoot me an email. Also, I, I neglected to say we've got a Kentic user Slack that's uh, very, very lively and interesting. So I'm also hanging out over there quite a bit. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. And thanks, everybody, for joining us today. We'll see you in the next one. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.